Welcome to Gerard Alliance Church Online. I'm so glad that you decided to watch this video. I'm excited because we're going to look for two weeks at David's Mighty Men. But before that, I, I want to pray for you. I want to pray for me, for our time together, that God uh, would remove any sort of distractions and allow us to focus on His Word, His truth, and what He wants to speak into us. So would you take a moment and pray with me? Father God, we thank you and praise you for this time, Lord. I look forward to this every single week. And Lord, I just pray right now for any needs that are there, for those who are watching, I pray that you will meet them where they are. Whether they're physical, emotional, spiritual, mental, social, Lord God, we pray for all of these needs that we have. And right now, we lay them at your feet. Never to pick them up knowing that we've surrendered them to you and you have what's best in mind for us. We love you and we thank you. We give you all the glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen and amen. Well, to begin the message today, I want you to take just a brief moment to think about this question. Really, really, really critically analyze this question. The question is, who do you surround yourself with? Who do you surround yourself with? Who do you keep company with? And when we think about the power of influence, are they influencing you or are you influencing them? Are they influencing you or are you influencing them? Of course, we know that, that influence is a two-way street, but my concern has more to do with the moments that a crisis of belief occurs where it's either your reputation or your faith in God that's on the line. Which one do you choose? Your reputation among men or your faith in God? Throughout the Bible, we see these situations take place from Noah to Moses and Aaron to Gideon and Samson to David and Solomon and Rehoboam to Elijah and the list could be endless. And I'd love to say at this very moment that every opportunity was handled properly and people's lives every time were changed for the better, but that's simply not the case. Listen to this, Noah's drunkenness created a rift within the family line. Moses was, was kept out of the promised land because of his temper tantrum against a rock. And Aaron's people-pleasing tendencies created the golden calf. Gideon was too weak. Samson was too strong. David and Solomon had more wives that they, than they could count. Rehoboam split the kingdom in two because of his greed and for fear of the wicked queen Jezebel. Isabel, Elijah asked God to take his life, to end his life. You know, if you read through the Bible in its entirety, it's, it's fascinating how even through the heartache and sorrow and disappointment and regret and shame, God brings about a beautiful story of redemption and mercy and love and grace. It's a passionate pursuit of God towards humanity. But there are moments that we see man pursuing God. I love what A.W. Tozer wrote in his book, The Pursuit of God. He says this, God wants us to worship him. He doesn't need us. For he couldn't be a self-sufficient God and need anything or anybody, but he wants us. When Adam sinned, it was not he who cried out, God, where are you? It was God who cried out, Adam, where are you? All throughout scripture, we see these incredible moments, the silver linings, if you will, of hope restored, faith strengthened, and promises fulfilled. And what's the end goal? 
What's the end goal? What's, what's the final result that we're looking for? What is the purpose of God's redeeming work? And Tozer writes this. He remembers, that's God, our frame and knows that we are dust. He may sometimes chasten us, it is true, but even this he does with a smile. The proud, tender smile of a father who is bursting with pleasure over an imperfect but promising son who is coming every day to look more and more like the one whose child he is. In other words, the goal for us is to be transformed into the likeness of Jesus. There's always been something I've been grateful for throughout my life. And it's the people whom God has used to make who I am today. The people who I've centered my life around. Whether it's through a friendship or, or relationship or conversation or encouragement or challenge, success or failure. God has used people in my process of becoming more like Jesus. And so today and next week we're going to look at a, a, a pretty interesting moment in Israelite history. We're going to look at David's mighty men. And I've talked about this in the past, but it's remarkable to see the influence that militant victories have had on nations and how it's either established them or have brought them to ruin. And it's no different for Israel. But here's the interesting thing about us as believers in Jesus Christ, as us as followers of God. We have to realize that this story that we read in the Bible, Old Testament into New, is significant to us because it, be, because it becomes a part of our own story. So with that being said, please turn with me into your Bibles to 2 Samuel 23, 8-18. through 18. 2 Samuel 23, 8 through 18. The first point is what makes them great and mighty? What makes them great and mighty? We're going to look at verses 8 through 12. 2 Samuel 23, 8 through 12. <clears throat> Excuse me. The word of God says this. These are the names of David's mighty men. Josheb, Beshebeth, a Tekemonite was chief of the three. He raised his spear against 800 men whom he killed in one encounter. Next to him was Eleazar, son of Dodai, the Ahohite. As one of the three mighty men, he was with David when they taunted the Philistines gathered at Pastamim for battle. Then the men of Israel retreated, but he stood his ground and struck down the Philistines till his hand grew tired and froze to the sword. The Lord brought about a great victory that day. The troops returned to Eleazar, but only to strip the dead. Next to him was Shema, son of Agi, the Herorite. When the Philistines banded together at a place where there was a field full of lentils, Israel's troops fled from them. But Shema took his stand in the middle of the field. He defended it and struck the Philistines down. And the Lord brought about a great victory. So we're given in, in a description with an introduction that's pretty intriguing. The names of David's mighty men would provoke within us a, a curiosity on the list of names that would come next. When, when I was in high school, I, I tried to read my entire Bible from cover to cover. I wanted to read from Genesis all the way into Revelation. And it was actually a dream of mine so that I could say, I did it, you know. Kind of like people who say they want to run a marathon or swim with sharks or go bungee jumping, which in all three of these cases, you couldn't pay me to do any of them, but it was a feat, reading the entire Bible through and through, that I was willing to strive after. But I'm telling you, <laughs> lists, wow. Like, all these genealogies you have to read through from Genesis to Leviticus and Numbers, I, I mean, I began to wonder, what is so great about lists? What's so great about them? 
What makes these people important? What's the significant significance of all these begets, right? Because it's just name after name after name after name. And it can be fairly overwhelming at times because, listen, the, <laughs> these are names we can't even pronounce right. We can't even pronounce them correctly. And I don't know about you, but I like to be in the know. I like to, to connect the dots, so to speak. Was this person significant? What did they do in history? Do we know them for, for who they are? Or do we know them for what they did? Are they just a name or are they a story, an opportunity, a means of God's grace? Then we come across lists like the ones we're looking at, to, the one we're looking at today. There's some lists within the Bible that, that don't just give us names, but also a description or a moment of testimony. For instance, if we read <clears throat> the genealogy of Jesus found in Matthew 1, all seems to be good and well, right? We're reading through these names. Names that are significant, that, that have tradition and history. The makings of an important, an important lineage that began with Abraham and now concludes with Jesus, right? In Matthew 1. Now, listen though, you have to understand, you have to realize that women were never included in genealogies. They weren't. In a patriarchal society, it was about the seed of men. So-and-so beget so-and-so beget so-and-so. The significance. It was about the significance of, of sons, inheritance, and heritage. But, but notice now, notice in Matthew 1, 3, 5, and 6, it reads this. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Solomon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Each one of these descriptions that we're given here, we know for some reason or another that these women are significant. It was through Tamar that this genealogy of Jesus began. Rahab, who was a prostitute from Jericho, hid two spies for Joshua and the Israelites so that they could scout out Jericho and overtake it. It was the very first land that they took as they conquering as they're conquering the promised land. Ruth was David David's grandmother and Uriah's wife, which we know is Bathsheba, was David's wife and Solomon's mother. I mean, wow. <laughs> Talk about distinction, right? But think about the, the, the disruption and mess, even within the genealogy of Jesus. What makes them great and mighty? So all that to say, we see this list that's written about David's mighty men, and this description that follows is unique, of course, in and of itself. Yes, it lists David's mighty men, 37 in all, but there are moments of explanation. And these explanations and exceptions is what would beg the question, what makes them great and mighty? So just briefly, I want to unpack each one of these descriptions for a moment. And, and you may be wondering, uh, Pastor, how, how are you going to make this relatable and applicable to us today? Well, just hold on now. There is a method to my madness. But, but for now, let's look at each one individually. First up is Jesheb Beshebeth. And we're told that he was the chief of the three. Now, just to clarify... It was not uncommon for kings to set up commanders and chiefs that would be responsible to lead a group or a band of soldiers into battle. So David's mighty men included 37, and they were probably, um, they were probably raids or grouped up into 10 soldiers, and these were soldiers. These were heavily, heavily trained and armed men who were battle ready. 
So these three would have been chosen by David to lead the other 34 into raids and battles and wars. And the most obvious characteristic is that men of this stature who were counted among the three, they, were need, they needed to be loyal and dedicated and, feel, and fierce. They, they had to be trusted. They had to be field generals, right? They had to be trusted by David to lead this band of warriors to victory. He not only trusted the three, he placed his life and safety and well-being at the expense of these three. So, to be a part of the three is a pretty huge accomplishment, right? Talk about an amazing achievement. But, but not only that, not only to be among the three, but the chief of the three? Wow. That's saying something. That is. Okay, okay. We have surpassed important. And it seems as if Josheb would be trusted way beyond the status quo. He would be held in high honor. There would be something about this man that shouts great and mighty. And I can't help but think that it's not just about holding the title of chief of the three. For him to become the chief, it would have taken more than just an application and dream turned into reality kind of situation. So, what does he do? What does Josheb do? What makes him great and muddy? Well, well, here it is. Are you ready? It says, he raised his spear against 800 men whom he killed in one encounter. 800 men. I found this story very interesting because the same story is found in 1 Chronicles 11, 11 but the details are a little different. One, in 1 Chronicles 11, 11 it says that he killed 300 men, uh, not 800, but still 300 is Seems to be pretty impressive. And two, according to rabbinical literature, Josheb was given the nickname Ha-ez-enzi, Ha-ezni, which means the man as strong as a tree. Ha-ezni, the man as strong as a tree. That's why he was given that name, because of his heroic deeds and his strength in battle. This is what made Josheb Great and mighty. That's why he was chosen as chief among the three. Up next, Eliezer. What made Eliezer great and mighty? We're told that when all the Israel troops fled, it was David and Eliezer that stood their ground. It was just those two that were left. It says, he stood his ground and struck down the Philistines. Here's what made him great and mighty. He struck down so many Philistines that it says his hand grew tired and froze to the sword. I mean, literally, this guy was doing the same motion, the same muscles, all of the exertion and strength was sapped from him that it seized his hand to the sword. He never let up. He continued to rout the Philistines by the strength that God gave him. So what made him great? That's what made him mighty. What made him great? It says the Lord brought about a great victory that day. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Pastor. I, I thought you just said that it was Eleazar. Oh, yes, yes. He was the vessel that God used to bring about that victory, but who made Eleazar great? God. God did. In Zechariah 4, 6, it says this, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Do you know that today? Do you believe that today? Could you attest that in your own life that what makes us great and mighty does not come from us, but from what God gives to us? 
Well, how do you know that, Pastor? Because look at what happened to the rest of the troops, <laughs> right? In, in the moment, what did they do? They all fled. They fled. What that tells me is that they were fighting from their own strength. They were not relying on the strength of the Lord or, or his presence even. They weren't trusting him in the moment. No, all they could do and did was flee. Until, oh, look at this. Until, whoo, look out now. Until the battle was over. We're told the troops returned to Eliezer, but only to strip the dead. What? Yep, it's true. They came, they saw, they fled, they came back, they saw, they took, they left. You know, they weren't concerned about who made it out alive. Their only concern at this point was the bounty that had been left. Whatever they could get out of the loot. They, they took it. They weren't soldiers in that moment. They were scavengers. Scavengers. But listen, this is what made Eleazar mighty and great. He was willing to make a stand when his life was on the line. He was willing to take a stand when his life was on the line. He entrusted his ability and strength to God and God alone. He chose to take a stand. Of course, for us, we may never see a battlefield, but I'm telling you what. We're living in a culture and society that if you are aware of what's going on for 10 minutes you will realize and understand that we are fighting an everyday battle. A day-by-day -day battle. Jesus said, the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, The devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. I don't know about you, but I feel this, and I sense it, and I see it. In our society, in our homes, in our families, in our communities, in our nation and world. Hey, listen, we are called as followers of Jesus to take a stand against everything that goes against God, the truth of his word, and the way he made this world. And it seems as if, at times, we as believers in Jesus Christ, us as, as churchgoers, us as Christians, we are fighting the wrong battles. Or, or we're honing in on, on that when we really should be emphasizing this. Listen, Ephesians 6, 12, and 13 says this. For our struggle, our battle, is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And then we're told, therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may flee. Right? You may find safety until everything blows over and then you can come back and reap the reward. No, no, he says, therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything, to stand. Finally, rounding out the three, we meet a man by the name of Shema. There's not much detail about his own personal story, but again, what made him mighty? He took his stand in the middle of a field full of lentils against a Philistine army. And so he defended that field and struck the enemies down. What made him great? 
Well, once again, we see the phrase, the Lord brought about a great victory. So if you're wondering the significance of what this story brings to our own life, that's the key. The key is to understand that the Lord brings about great victory. Have you celebrated great victories in your life lately? So what makes them great and mighty? The Lord. The Lord does. Secondly, what sets them apart? What sets them apart? Look at verses 13 through 18. During harvest time, three of the thirty chief men came down to David at the cave of Adullam, while a band of Philistines was encamped in the valley of Rephaim. At that time, David was in the stronghold, and the Philistine garrison was at Bethlehem. David longed for water and said, Oh, that someone would get me a drink of water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem. So the three mighty men broke through the Philistine lines, drew water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem, and carried it back to David. But he refused to drink it. Instead, he poured it out before the Lord. Far be it from me, O Lord, to do this, he said. Is it not the blood of men who went at the risk of their lives? And David would not drink it. Such were the exploits of the three mighty men. Okay, okay. So you may be wondering this question about the three. So what sets them apart? There had to be something, a a situation, an action that occurred on all three of them that set them apart from the rest. Well, the obvious answer is that they were given a specific uh, story of a victory that had occurred where they stood their ground, right? We just looked at that a minute ago. And, And this wasn't any natural feat of the imagination. This was a battle that was won through the strength and might of God that was given to them. And what's cool is, is we'll see next week that even among the 34 mighty men there were victories and achievements that would seem that they could have even been chosen as one of the three, but they didn't. They were not chosen. So if they were not chosen but seem to have had just as much impact and influence as the three, we come back to that question that we just asked. What sets them apart? Well, I'm glad you asked. (laughs) This story that is told of the bravery and loyalty of the three is astounding. To us, it doesn't seem like much, right? We probably can't wrap our head around some of these details that were given. There's no doubt in our minds that at this point, that the three who risked their lives is none other than Josheb, Eleazar, and Shema. I mean, if you think about it, they've already risked their lives so many times on the battlefield. And to risk their lives for the sake of another man's life, or, or their nation, or land, that's one thing, right? That, that makes sense. That's heroic. But again, can we really fathom the importance of water here? The importance of water. We don't have enough time today, but, but water was a symbol, symbolism of salvation and purity. We see it from Noah's Ark all the way through, and we see all of these different significances uh, for water. But, but these three men went to great lengths for their king and commander. And, and what I wonder is when David expressed his question, When he expresses his question, did he really think that anyone would take him up on his offer? Come on, come on, those of you who are married, you know that you make suggestions through through a, a, a passive kind of way. You say something in hopes that somebody else will follow through with that, right? And so you wonder if that's happening here. And what's crazy is that if usually if someone were to do something for the king... David, in this, in this moment, he would place a reward on it. But here, David is just simply speaking or voicing a deep longing that he has. 
You know, think of those moments where you're, you know, you're exercising or you're out somewhere and you haven't had your favorite pizza in a long time and you just kind of say, hey, I wish I had this or I wish I had this ice cream, right? And so David is expressing this deep longing and then it happens. These great and mighty men, all of a sudden, all three of them get up, they break through the enemy lines, they draw water from that very well at the gate of Bethlehem, and they bring it back to David. Wow! I mean, they'd be heroes, right? They would go down in Israelite history, almost in a moment of madness, for the sake of fetching water for their king. I mean, this is no Jack and Jill story. Listen, just think about this. From the valley of Rephaim to the gate of Bethlehem to the cave of Adullam, it's all about 13 miles worth. So round trip, it would be 26 miles or so, give or take. Not to mention the heightened risk of their lives for the sake of water. Water. Is it really worth the risk? I mean, I can understand wine or milk or honey, anything that seems a lot more valuable than water. But regardless, this is what sets them apart from the rest. This is what did it for them. This act of selflessness, this moment turns into an even more unthinkable action. David, listen guys, David doesn't drink the water. I mean, are you kidding me? Can can you imagine? Think about this. Can you just imagine for a moment someone making this beautiful meal for you? You're starving to death at the same time, and yet when they present it to you, you walk over to the trash can, lift the lid, and dump it all in. I mean, how on earth does any of that make sense? Right? Right? And and my gut reaction to all this is that if I were one of the three, I would be fuming. I would be fuming. I'd be beyond frustrated. I'd be mad that I risked my life for water that David didn't even drink. But listen, it wasn't the action that was important. It wasn't the reaction that David had by pouring the water out. Rather, it was the reason and intention behind it. See, David, in this moment, as he pours out the water, he wanted to show all three of them through great lengths of of his appreciation and their honor, he pours out the water, quote-unquote, before the Lord. But in in our minds, I mean, wouldn't we think, you know, that it'd be more honoring if he drank what they gave him? You see, no. No, for that would place David's need of water above the three's value and self-worth. Think about it. They risked their lives their very existence for the sake of his thirst to be quenched for a moment. And that's why David exclaims, is it not the blood of men who went at the risk of their lives? You see, what David is saying in this moment is the risk they made is so much more valuable and honoring than fulfilling one of his basic needs. And we find the outcome. We just talked about it. David would not drink it. Why? Because what they did, the three risking their lives, set them apart. Set them apart. Those are the very actions that placed these three There, the chief of the three and a part of the three. That's what set them apart. Can I ask you today, what sets you apart? We started out talking about influence and the company that we keep. 
whether it's at work, home, school, in the community, on the sports team, what would you say sets you apart? The way you live your life, the words that you say and, and things that you do, does it bring glory and honor to God? I love what's said here at the end. It says, such were the exploits of the three mighty men. The exploits. That means a, a bold or daring feat. An action that becomes an accomplishment. Let me ask, if, if exploits were written about you in your life, what would it include? What sets you apart from the rest of the world? Listen, living in a culture that shouts, stick to the status quo, don't rock the boat, fall in line and know your place. My prayer for each one of us, my prayer for each one of us in the church worldwide is that we'll be bold and take our stand so that we may be set apart for the glory of God and the advancement of his kingdom. Would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you and praise you for this message today. And Lord, I, I don't know what part of this um, you spoke into those who are watching, but Lord, I just pray that it will really resonate. Lord, we've heard your word. Now may, by the power of your Holy Spirit, may you apply it to our lives. And ultimately, may we become more like Jesus as we seek to advance your kingdom. In your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Go in that grace. Thank you.